Disclaimer. Please forgive me now for there may be mispronunciations in this video. Within the house on 65 Mulberry Street of the town Quitman, Arkansas, there was a couple named Weaver. They were experiencing odd events that would have them inviting the Central Arkansas Society for Paranormal Research. These experiences involved lights turning on and off on their own, sudden noises, cold spots, and the feeling someone else was living with them inside the house. So, in 2005, Tony Weaver, one of the occupants next to his wife, told the Central Arkansas Society for Paranormal Research founder, Karen Sheelins, that he came across their ad in the local newspaper and called them because he saw a man dressed as a World War I soldier staring from the foyer into the living room. Tony wasn't the only person who had experienced something in that house. Two years earlier, a renovator named Ed Mernerlin was working in the house at night when he saw a large weird looking man with long brown hair creepy eyes and great big arms and hands, holding something in the sunroom. Ed claimed that the man walked right in front of him and glared at him before disappearing into the hall. Ed felt a cold wind down his back when the figure passed him. In the small town of Equipment, with at one point around 740 residents, rumors began to spread about the mysterious dog boy of Equipment, whose piercing eyes could sometimes be spotted in the upstairs window of the house late at night. This started the legend of Gerald Bettis, also known as Dog Boy. There are websites and YouTube videos that make this legend a little chilling, if not ridiculous. But whose case of the true story being more interesting than the actual urban legend? I got majority of this information off a Medium article which claims that the paranormal websites and YouTube videos get the story wrong. I will be adding quotes from the Medium article randomly through this video and will provide the article down in the description box below. One of the hysterical quotes from these websites was represented like this. Inside this sleepy little town lurks the most astonishing account of terror and torture that many investigators had ever encountered. Or, had it not been for the actual newspaper's accounts and police records, it would have been hard to fathom the degree of cruelty he rendered on his parents. Here is the true story about the house on Mulberry Street. It was sometime around 1890 when a family named Garrett constructed the house in Quitman. The house itself was two stories high and sits at the corner of Mulberry and 3rd Streets. A local woman named Mary Nell Hollibird, remember that last name because it pops up in this story quite a bit, Mary recalled to writer Lisa Armstrong in the October 28, 2007 Arkansas Democrat Gazette that Benjamin Jackson moved in the house with his wife. In 1898, the couple had a son named Joseph. Joseph would serve in World War I, but unfortunately died at the age of 21. His mother passed away at the age of 28. You must question whether or not it was Joseph, the World War I soldier, who may have been the apparition seen by the Weavers. Over a decade, the house remained empty until Floyd and Aline Bettis moved in around 1951. They were childless at first, until they had a son on July 23, 1953, and he was named Gerald Floyd Bettis. Gerald was sometimes known as Gerald, and was a challenging child even more so as he aged. It is said that Floyd and Aline were good parents, but Gerald was a disturbed child who craved attention in inappropriate and tasteless ways. For example, there was a family reunion at Quitman City Hall. Gerald opened a chase lounge then in the center of the room. In front of the crowd, he reclined back like a Roman emperor and popped grapes into his mouth one at a time. It is unsure if the bullying he received caused him to act like this. Kids at Quitman Elementary School often stole from him and teased him over his size. When he grew into a teenager, he continued down the path of disturbing behavior, including collecting stray cats and dogs, leading to his teasing nickname Dog Boy. What no one realized was that Gerald was not just collecting the animals, but torturing and killing them. Signs of a serial killer. Neighbors told reporter Lisa Armstrong in 2007 that we could hear them howl. Paranormal websites and YouTube videos would go on saying something like this. While these acts in themselves are quite atrocious, no one ever dreamed of the nightmares that would ensue. As his lust for violence grew, the size of his prey grew from simple household pets to something much more disturbing. People. 
What is even more unnerving about this eventual descent into abyss of evil was that Dog Boy's human victims weren't faceless acquaintances. Jero, who grew to be 6'4 and around 300 pounds, would physically and psychologically abuse his parents. As just a teenager, he reportedly beat his father regularly and in one time threw him out the second story window. At the time, Floyd was 67 years of age and managed to hang onto the window ledge until the police came after being called by a neighbor. Many details of the abuse didn't come out until Gerald was in prison years later. One of the discoveries of abuse was that he frequently locked his parents upstairs for days or even weeks at a time, taking them food only when he got around to it. He managed to get money after building a sunroom on the house and sold homegrown marijuana out of it. According to the Heber Springs Sun Times, Floyd died in January of 1981, supposedly from an illness while at home. Due to rumors brought on by the paranormal websites, it is thought that Floyd had been pushed down the stairs by Gerald and died of a broken neck. It is true that Gerald abused his parents, but they weren't the only ones. He also terrorized his neighbors. A neighbor, Nelda, Kennedy reported that she was scared of him because of his eyes. If you had ever seen his eyes, she said in 2007, they seemed to glow at night. The same neighbor, Nelda, also stated in an interview that when Gerald and some relatives started cleaning up around the house, an uncle came over and asked if he could borrow a gun because he was afraid that Gerald would get riled up. The abuse he caused on his parents would start to unravel when his mother, Aline, fell or was pushed and broke her hip. This required her to stay at the Baptist Health Hospital at Heber Springs. Mary Hollibird, a retired nurse, saw the treatment Gerald put on his mother. He was slapping her around, she recalled, and telling her, I'm going to have you arrested if you tell anyone what I did. After the scene, Aline was permanently removed from the house and placed in adult protective services. After she was questioned, Gerald was arrested for parental abuse and distribution. He was convicted and remained at the Arkansas Department of Corrections in 1984. He died of a drug overdose while in DOC custody on May 18, 1988 at the age of 34. The house would go around to a few people after this. At first, it remained in Aline's custody until her death in October 1995. It then go to Hollibird's niece, Reba Carter. Reba sold the house to the Reavers and that was when the paranormal events began. Tony Weaver, the husband who saw the World War I era soldier, also saw lights turning on and off by themselves and pennies floating down the stairs. After six months of activity, the couple left. Mary Hollibird's nephew, Quentin White, and his wife rented the house from the Weavers in 2003 and reported similar occurrences, including toilets flushing by themselves at random times. What had them leave was one day while Quinton was working on the house, he heard a crash upstairs while he was downstairs on the phone with his wife. He hung up and ran upstairs and allegedly found previously stacked pile of 2x4s all standing on their ends. They left after just a few months. The CASPR, the paranormal group that was invited to investigate the house, came by twice. They located code spots and unexplainable electromagnetic fields, but what startled them the most was when they saw a face staring down from the second story window when they were out to get some gear from the car when no one was upstairs. On the second visit, the team brought a medium, who allegedly located what seemed to be the spirit of Gerald. Karen Schillings, the lead researcher, stated the medium claimed he cursed us and told us to get out. Could there be a couple of spirits haunting the house? Or was it hysteria that ignited an urban legend? What do you think? Did you like this video? Want to support this channel and get early access? Feel free to check out my Patreon page where I create content on cryptids, hauntings, alien abductions, seers, killers, and much more. Can't support me there? Like, comment, and subscribe here.